Welcome to our online service today. As we meet together, may we know, wherever we are, the presence of the Lord. Just a couple of announcements. Next Sunday, we will be having our jam and CY Nativity service here in the church building at half past 11. And then the following Sunday, we have decided to have our carol service at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. As we offer our worship to God, we remind ourselves of the one who created us, loves us, and sent his son for us. So let us with the psalmist say, I will extol the Lord with all my heart. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. We join in praise as we sing with the praise band, Light of the World, Here I Am to Worship. Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, our, our Heavenly Father, you made this world, you made us in your image. You gave us paradise and we rejected it. You gave us life in all its fullness and we settled for mediocrity. How could we have let this happen when your love and your grace is amazing? Father, we have thrown your grace back in your face when we rebel against you. When we fail to acknowledge you to be the Lord. We might as well have joined with the crowds in Jerusalem declaring that we do not want this man Jesus to rule over us. And yet, Lord God, we see around us clear evidence that you are the greatest. Any man made God, image or idol is impotent in your presence. Show your power, O God, and demonstrate again your sovereignty over all. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your coming into the world to be our Saviour. Thank you for your life of love, your willing obedience, and the gracious invitation to lay our burden of sin down at your feet. 
Grant us the forgiveness we so desperately need so that we can live in fellowship with God our Father. May we loathe anything that hinders our daily walk with you. So, Holy Spirit, come and reveal our failures of word and deed. Reveal those flaws even in our good deeds so that we will turn in humility to the Saviour who is willing to cleanse us from all our sin. Then, Holy Spirit, teach us what it means to live as a new creation. Help us to become more like our Lord and Master every day. May we bring you honour and uplift your holy name among the nations, O God. Our God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, may we glorify and adore you. May we accept you and your word, not only with words on our lips, but with true devotion in our hearts. Let our worship come before you in spirit and truth, and may the offering of ourselves in loving and loyal service be the hallmark of our daily lives. Father God, hear our prayer, for we come through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as we join together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 1, and we read the first 14 verses. Let's hear God's word as Geraldine reads it for us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. During the week we heard these words, There is light at the end of the tunnel. This was in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine that had gotten the approval of the MHRA. We've been waiting for this since the beginning of the pandemic. It has been such a long, dark tunnel, that which has brought so much pain, suffering, heartache and sorrow. Thankfully, there is a light of hope shining at the end of the tunnel. As I thought of light in the darkness, it immediately brought to mind some verses from the passage we read earlier in John chapter 1. Turn again with me in your Bible. Look at what it says in verses 4 to 9. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. I want to look briefly at five aspects of this light. The first thing we need to discover is the identity of the light. 
From the beginning of John's Gospel, we can see the light is one and the same as the Word. Look at verses 1 to 3. They speak of the Word. In the beginning was the Word. That's another way of saying eternal. The Word was with God. Co-eternal. The Word was God. Fully divine. Not only co-eternal, but co-creator. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. John straight away goes on to talk about life and light. In verse 4, life is associated with light. If you think of the first chapter of Genesis, what was the first part of creation? Let there be light. That was the beginning of life. But it's more than that. In John's Gospel, the theme of life runs the whole way through. And it's always linked to the Lord Jesus. So when John writes, in him was life, he was referring to the fullness of God. Jesus was bringing to the earth the fullness of the life of God. And that is good news, or bringing light into the world. As the one through whom all things were created, then it follows that he has given life to all and is the source of life, abundant and eternal. This light is available for everyone. It is not hidden. Jesus was to declare, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's John 8 verse 12. The second thing we notice is the power of the light. Even the smallest candle can dispel darkness. John affirms this when he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness is another theme that we find throughout John's writing. Darkness equals sinfulness, the kingdom of the evil one. It brings with it fear. The thing we know, need to note is that powerful though the kingdom of darkness is, it cannot match the light. The light of Christ is that which cannot be extinguished. When the light is switched on in a dark room, the darkness disappears. It is overcome. Darkness cannot overcome the light. You know, as we look around us today, we could easily become discouraged as we see darkness. Darkness in various forms. Evil is crouching near. Greed, hatred, cruelty, self-ambition and the like. It's not always readily detectable, but it is there. Subtle manoeuvring. We also need to take on board the other translation of the Greek word which has this meaning, the darkness cannot comprehend it. This can be seen in the world when they just don't get it. They don't understand Jesus or the need for his coming into the world. They cannot understand what all the fuss is about. This leads us to consider the acceptance of the light. When Jesus came into the world, he revealed the plan of God. He came to show the world the love of God and to tell them of God's desire to have people return to him, to that deep loving relationship with him. The sin that separated them from God would be dealt with by Jesus Christ. Jesus declared that those who saw him saw the Father. This was the light coming into the world. By receiving his message, and in turn accepting his message, they would be restored to God. But there is the point. They had to listen to the message, believe the message and accept it. Later on in the passage we read that all those who accepted Christ and believed in his name were given the right to be called the children of God. They were adopted into the family of God. Wow! Children of God. What does that entail? It means that we can call God our Heavenly Father. We can know his fatherly care. We can have Jesus as our Good Shepherd and the Holy Spirit as our Comforter and Guide. It means we receive an inheritance. Unlike earthly life, 
When we die, someone else inherits our estate, our money, our earthly possessions. But for the believer, when they die, they gain an inheritance. The Apostle Peter writes about it. He explains that our inheritance has been all gained by the Lord Jesus. And we read, In God's great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All this is promised to those who believe, who have accepted or received him into their lives. It's wonderful when we hear of people accepting the message. We're told in scripture that there's great rejoicing in heaven over a sinner coming to Christ. As a church family, we ought to be praying, praying for our children, praying for our young people, praying for the teenagers, that they will do what the preacher says in Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. And indeed, we should be praying for those who are elderly, who as yet have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Saviour. As it says in verses 6 and 7 of the same chapter, Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And of course, we should be praying for everyone else in between. Again, this leads us logically to the next point about light, and that is the rejection of the light. In verse 11, it says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. What a tragedy. They were the ones who should have been expecting his arrival. The prophets had foretold the event. Indeed, Isaiah talked about the light coming into the world. In his prophecy, chapter 9, here's what we read. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. But they did not receive him. They would not believe him. The previous verse in John 1 says that the world did not recognise him. How come? Well, they had their own idea of what the light would be like. They were waiting for their Messiah. They had an idea of what he would look like, not physically, but the manner in which he would come, the way he would act, the ideals he would promote. To be honest, Jesus did not fulfil their criteria. His CV did not match their job description. He wasn't the Roman chasing warrior. He wasn't the ultra-conservative, paid-up member of the Pharisee Union. In their eyes, he flouted the Sabbath day regulations. He mixed with the wrong class of people. And as for his teaching, it went well beyond what was permissible for a rabbi of the day. Others rejected him because when he spoke, it made them too uncomfortable. His words exposed traits in their lives and thinking, which they would rather ignore. Like the pompous, rich, young ruler who boasted about keeping the law and wondered if there possibly could be something more he could do to inherit eternal life. When Jesus told him to go and sell all that he had and help the poor, that was a step too far. He went away sad for he had loads of riches. Or when a crowd of self-righteous leaders were about to stone a woman for committing adultery, he catches them out by a simple statement. He who is without sin cast the first stone. How did that end? After spending some time writing with his finger in the dust, he stands up and the accusers had all gone. Before we think he was condoning her action, after saying, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. You see, these examples are but a commentary on the verses we find in John 3, 19 and 20. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. The previous verse gives us the result of rejection. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe 
stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's John 3 verse 18. How sad that is. Yet down through the centuries it has continued to happen. Paul, when writing to the church in Corinth, says, The evil one blinds people to the truth. He distracts their minds. He does all in his power to stop people coming to trust in Christ. For when they do, he has lost control in their lives. There may be even someone listening today who has not as yet seen the light. But it's difficult to ignore. Just think of the sun shining through the window. Yes, it shows up the dirt and grime and tells us that they need cleaned. The light of the gospel will do the same for our lives. But it needs action. We need to call for the Lord to come and cleanse us. Of course, we can ignore it. And indeed, we can become accustomed to it. And so we put off doing something about it. The thing is, a dirty window will not have catastrophic results. But to ignore our soul's salvation will have eternal consequences. There's one final thought on the passage in John 1, and that is the sharing of the light. We are told that John, who became known as the Baptist, came to bear witness to the light. He was not the light, but bore witness to it. He knew his mission in life was to tell people of Jesus. He was not drawing attention to himself, but rather at all times he was uplifting the Saviour. His message was straightforward. Pointing to Jesus, he was telling the people that he was the promised light and life. He told folk that Jesus was the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Yes, John was the chosen one to fulfil the task of being the forerunner. But we too, who claim to be believers, are to be engaged in sharing the light of the gospel. Helping people to understand the message of salvation. To lead them to Christ, who is the only saviour of the world. Wasn't it Jesus who said in his Sermon on the Mount, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, as you can see, it's not just by your words, but also your actions. And what's more, when both correspond, it is indeed very effective. There we have it. The light has come into the world, Jesus, the word of God. He came in flesh, full of grace and truth. We have discovered the identity of the light, the power of the light, the acceptance of the light, the rejection of the light and the sharing of the light. Now, how does it apply to you? Amen. Let us listen as the choir reminds us of the coming of the Lord Jesus, who is the light in the darkness, as they sing Emmanuel, an anthem recorded a few years ago. And then Joanne will lead us in our prayers for others.
Lord, as we bring to you our prayer for others, may we be reminded of your love and refuge at this time. As our nation continues to struggle with the pandemic, may we turn to you for help and strength. Lord, we thank you for the progress being made with the vaccine and pray that it will be effective in reducing the impact of the virus quickly. We continue to pray for our frontline workers in hospitals and care homes. We ask that you continue to strengthen them each day for all that they may face and ask that you keep them safe and well as they care for others. We pray for those who have been affected by illness caused by COVID-19 and ask that you bring healing. We especially pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask that they can experience your loving arms around them at this time, especially when grieving has been made more difficult due to the restrictions. During these latest restrictions, we pray for business owners and employees. These are worrying times and we pray for your wisdom and decisions being made and ask that you surround them with your presence, giving hope and peace. We continue to pray for our children and young people. We pray for their continued education and safety within schools and colleges. We thank you for our teachers and their dedication to teaching within such unsettling times. We pray for motivation despite many unknowns. Lord, we pray for our own church family when yet again we are unable to meet in person within the church building. We thank you for technology that we are able to watch or listen to our services for Zoom and for other methods of keeping in touch. As we think towards Christmas and the birth of your son, may we focus on you and continue to bring our worries and prayers to you. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Our final hymn is a prayer asking the Lord to shine the light of his love in our world today. As we join to sing, Shine, Jesus Shine.
May we go into this week to share the light of the gospel to those we meet. And to do so, we need the Lord's grace. So let us share together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.